everybody. Frenchie Smith. Do, um, do I, is this the show's format? I stay here? Yes, you okay. stay right there. Unless you want to <laughs> dance or something and get up and, you know, you can. Um, it, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, also, uh, Alec, congratulations. It's Alec, not Alex, right? That's right, yeah. Alec. And, and uh, Andre, Andre. Uh, the, Alec and Andre helped, helped, um, uh, helped me move um, uh, my studio recently. And um, I've, I've probably had a, a studio called The Bubble in six different spots. It's just like if it's my car is there, it's The Bubble, I suppose. <laughs> you know? right. um, but, you know, I've had a lot of different partners. And, and you know, right, you have those great attributes of, of those, those, those time capsules. But uh, at, at this point, I just moved into a new space and I'm the primary owner of the business now. And um, Andre and Alec uh, were um, highly recommended <laughs> by Ryan to come take a beating. And um, <laughs> so anyway, I have a death pact with you guys. <laughs> like, um, within reason, but like that is rock and roll code. Like, let me know how I can return the favor. Um, it's, it, now it's documented. But that's, uh, I'll always remember that. Thank you. Okay. Um, but I had like rider or U-Haul truck for two days and <laughs> moving a lot of big, heavy stuff. <laughs> Blood, um, sweat, tears, sure. Well, okay. I get to talk about me. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I primarily, so my real name is Chris Smith. Um, I, I, I moved to Austin in 1990. And at that point, uh, I, I started doing a thing that I, I, I think all kind of future uh, creatives should do is have a, uh, a good day job as you, you know, try to, and do it, do it really well, you know, even if you hate being there, but like hide it, suppress that, you know, disdain with your coworkers, right? Don't visibly place yourself above other people that you're working with in your day job, like really do, do it and do it well and with some pride and have that award you this other second self, you know, the creative self that kicks in and uh, kind of like Mighty Mouse or something, right? You know, but it's Clark Kent and Superman or Superwoman. It's all, it's all inclusive. Um, but uh, at that point, I was um, trying to be in bands and, and, uh, and I was an uh, employee of Whole Foods and uh, at, a, at a really amazing time, and I, and I, and I do want to just make a quick mention of this. Um, I had access to probably, right now Whole Foods is bought by Amazon, but it was built by a handful of people that uh, were really thinking outside of the box. They were, you know, and uh, this all relates to music. There's like an entrepreneurial sport, uh, sport to all of this, you know. Um, but my direct boss was I would say uh, Paul Galvin, who kind of was like a dad to me, tough dad as well. Um, I'm 18, you know, and, and uh, wanted to start a rock band. But um, I thought about him a lot uh, this year in particular, but he was probably like the number eight person in that, the seed of that company. And, and he really taught me a lot of good and bad lessons. But if I could somehow not be on his radar that he had to think about me. He taught me about the boss game. And, that, and as you get into the music, you know, the boss game isn't right. It's not just us with a third party. It's like it, the worst boss in rock and roll is the person in the mirror. You know, that's where it all goes. That's the eventual destination. Hip hop, country, whatever your vernacular is. But um, he taught me the boss game. It, it, Chris, if I have to think about you, I, I can't think about me. And that's why I get paid the big bucks. And I was like, once I learned just to kick ass what I was doing and then really just to, to be his friend and get along with him and not have him think about me in a negative way and have our conversations always be him and me, like look eye to eye with him, you know. It just taught me a lot of balance, I suppose, in the workforce. Um, but um, eventually I, was able, I had the luxury to uh, leave the job because... Um, Playing in bands meant it was time to go on tours, and um, you know that was kind of in a, in, in a time line where if you're in a or you're an indie band, and all of a sudden your your band is on MTV, 
you're, you're not going back to your job. So those, those things were kind of happening. Those happened to me when I was 22. And um, so that started me in, in, uh, my, into my path musically as a performer and a writer and band member, a guitarist. And, um, and that, that band needed to make recordings and all of a sudden we're in the recording studio. And so that, uh, I'll probably stop talking about the band stuff so much, uh, a few more points of references. But um, once, once we got into a recording studio, uh, there, there was something very seductive about it and it, 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 it felt like, the whole thing felt like a musical instrument. And so uh, I, I really loved it. And, um, and the time, this is mid, or 1994, the, the way music was recorded directly affected how you could mix it. So if, um, and I'm not gonna say it was better or worse, it's just how it was. So back then, if you had the sound and the performance you liked, cool, you could turn it up or down, you could change what speaker it was in, add, add a few different sounds, and right, and if you really break down in your mind, the special effects that we have. We have like modulation ones like chorus, phaser, flanger, wobbly or slow. Um, we have reverb, we have delay, and we have different levels of compression, um, um, phase inversion, subtle equalization, heavy compression, heavy equalization, volume up and down. I mean, there, is there, are there any other big effects? Pitch shifting, that's about it. You know, and so if you wanted to do any of those applications to one of the tracks, you better have that unit per track. So um, it was a big, it was a big game. You know, you mean there weren't plugins back then? They're not <laughs> plugins, and 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 the organizational skills, how to make it all make sense. And then you were mixing, even though there was automation. Um, the studios that the indie bands that could could afford didn't really have automation. Yeah, it was so hand automation. You had to perform it. We had four people on the board doing this. Yeah. But all of that was, um, I, I just, you know, I, I, I saw the whole thing as, as an extension of, of this kind of ghetto um, guitar pedal board I'd put together, you know? Um, so I was like, oh, it's just like that. So I was hooked. And um, so probably uh, by 1997, um, the mid 1997, I, I ventured out into starting to produce groups that I wasn't in. So that was kind of a turning point. I still didn't have a studio, and uh, but I'd, I'd had the luxury of um, working on a record for six months in different pretty nice recording studios with my band, and so um, is a very luxurious thing. And I and I. I'm, I'm really grateful. I wasn't in the studio as the intern or the gopher, uh, even though if that would have been available to me, I would have done it. I was in there as a songwriter and then as the co-producer. And so someone twice my age had to actually listen to my opinion. So, wow. And um, um, so uh, we were in a recording studio called Hyde Street in San Francisco, so I got to hear what a Neve console sounded like. And so you learn these words and starting to hear sounds get um, manipulated with outboard gear and, and the how, how you play differently or sing different uh, with it. And so I just got more and more deep into the experience. Um, does, this, does this happen to anyone where you were in a recording session and all of a sudden just the sound of it was way more exciting than the song? <laughs> so. so that, that division of self started happening. Um, but for sure, instead of just, <clears throat> it, it affected my uh, performances as a, as a player. It was the, if the sound was right, I could play fewer notes and I could hear my band members better. It's like, wow. So all of it, I was just hooked. So uh, from that point, 1997, um, I produced uh, the first band called, um, that I wasn't in called Angel Knows by the Trail of Dead, and they're still going, so it's, it's uh, just kind of an inspiration that the first band I produced is still a band, 
Because, I mean, from 1997 until now, a lot of people are just come and gone in, in many ways. Some, some aren't even with us. Uh, rock and roll is a crazy world. Uh, and uh, I, convinced, I convinced them that I should produce them because um, I had just spent six months working on my band's record with John Crossland. And so in California, so, you know, the water was really good there and I was smart and I knew how to produce them. So, um, so I would say what I did know is I knew that I loved their band, but I think the fact that I knew how to produce them was bullshit. So um, um, we, we, there was a bizarre opportunity where there was a, <clears throat> a recording studio that a friend of mine wa um, was the assistant at and the owner was, had, was on vacation and told the assistant, well, while I'm gone, um, get to know the studio. So he shares this information with me, probably at a, a nightclub. And I go, well, I know how we'll get to know the studio. I'm gonna bring a band in. And so we did that first, and you will know us by the Trail of Dead record. We recorded it and mixed it in six days. And we were just flying high, like, this is great. And, and he, he knew how to patch things together. And, and so I was like, what about that microphone on the drums? And, and um, um, I don't think anyone was exceptionally experienced, but we survived each other. And, um, uh, but even, even getting a, a record done in six days, getting anything done at any point is almost a miracle, right? Like just getting a, a band to agree on anything that are especially kind of ornery and they're rebels. And, um, and um, I, I think that was kind of our, our that was our game as, as I was the square one that wanted them to keep doing takes. Um, uh, but a, after that, um, by 1998, um, that's when the bubble was born. And so, so um, in its first incarnation. And so from that time, Okay, we're, we're approaching 2022, so yeah. 24 years. Yeah. Okay, so, so at this point, we're, it's kind of an, old, it's an old, cool, uh, old school recording institution, I suppose, right? Like Austin's had a lot of studios come and go in that timeline, or, or a lot of them just go, you know? That, so it's, um, so somehow, um, like, n like what my, one of my favorite bands is Nirvana. It's a, it's classic rock now, it's dad rock. And, and now my studio that I still feels like a fresh thing is kind of old school. I'm like, okay, I'm in this now too. But um, I, I, um, I, I, I think it's, I think having a recording studio has been um, a necessity to, to, to have like a meeting place for the action that I like. So I, I don't know if, if a young producer or any age has to own a studio, but for me, I, I quickly figured out that I needed like a headquarters to make the noise. So it, it, it was, a, I, I had to put that together out of uh, necessity. Well, I mean, I bet, you know, in 98 though, I mean, I think you, you would have had to really then. <clears throat> I mean, now it's way different, I it, think, but, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, um, I, 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 think, I think there's clicks a bit now in the music industry, but I think there's a bit more of an open mind that that um, that, yo uh, that younger people can be brilliant, and uh, I think back then it would have been hard for me to call up a, a a really cool Austin studio and try to get a deal because I was one of their boys and I was in the club. I wasn't in the club, so I had to make my own club. And so, uh, uh, yeah. It just, it was kind of those times. And, uh, and since then, you know, Austin's recording, uh, recording studio climate and maybe just like the whole world, right? It's, it's become more personalized and they're not all just like storefront visible buildings with, you know, the sign, you know, uh, a sign on the front door. They're all kind of secret little places, which I think that's where it should be. I think the recording session, recording session should be private and you, you shouldn't be on display, you know, if you don't wish to be. Sure. But um, I wonder if I'm just rambling on here and <laughs> any of this makes sense, but that's kind of how I got into the studio and oops, I'm now a recording studio owner. I don't think that was ever a dream, but I just wanted a place to, to have bands come meet me that I liked. 
and uh, we'll and go from there. I mean, you know, Frenchie's being modest. I mean, you know, the bubble's been, you know, probably one of the most popular trendy studios in Austin for 20 years or something, you know so I mean? Like all the cool bands, you know, anybody I've tried to record through the years ended up going over to the bubble eventually or something, you know what I mean? So I'm just making a point, you know, you, you, you've, you've had a relationship with just the Austin community that has been definitely unique, right? So, well, and well, still, still to the I'm day. I'm an Austin I mean. boy, you know, like I, I definitely, um, <clears throat> There, there's something about it as much as it's it's changing you know um there, there there's and 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 this is a tricky thing too right like recording school you're learning the rules well the more you know them it's good to know them as a cornerstone but allow yourself to break the rules as well and part of the power of the austin creative mind is um when when we're not too caught up with, uh, oh, I'm moving my my tra I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm my trajectory is going really great. I'm, I've passed level five. Now I'm on to six. It, it's not really an Austin Creative's point of view to pay too much attention to that, and you just bust through thresholds by being, and that's been in the water for a long time. And so, um, uh, be aware, you know, and have some some goals, but but also allow yourself just to be a mouth breather kind of kick ass and get it get let let the zone come to you and um but um but I, I suppose i have some questions maybe then we'll ask some questions okay so um who here is is a recordist you can be proud like about to, it i like to pretend yeah <laughs> and, and i'm sure okay. people online are raising their okay. hands too and, you know sure so um who here has a recording studio? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> cool. So I guess I could say that. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Andrew, you, you didn't raise your hand. Working on it. Working on it. Okay. Well, this brings up a point. Um, the recording studio, but right now I'm going to peer into your life. And I know that you and Alec, the two of you are good, right? Or you can deal with each other's crap just enough to like, like each other the next day. <laughs> That's a rock and roll relationship. <laughs> That's, that has balance. Well, what kind of gear do you have? Do you, do you have some good monitors, a few mics that you're proud of, some interfaces? I have a, a stereo pair of Neve compressors, five series. Do you have those, Alec? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, this is what I'm getting at. Um, you can you can be an island and have your own recording studio if you wish or you can find commonality with some of your brothers and sisters out there that are into the same stuff for example i this is probably the biggest business thing i will say to you please don't go broke buying all the cool stuff that you think you need to have i've done that and it's pretty awesome <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's optional in all sincerity. But if there's three of you and uh, <clears throat> you can allocate like a house that you manage to not trash and totally destroy the neighbor's dreams, like, right, you're really outside of that house, right, the noise and, right, you're behaving in a way that it's really square. You're not drawing a lot of attention to yourself. It doesn't say, Come break into the house. We have awesome music gear in here. And it's not even ours. It's the band's vi gear that's visiting. But if, if there's three of you and there's a recording space, Common's recording space in the house, doesn't that sound like a naturally occurring business model that the location is like the headquarters? And that means you have three staff members where you could work together or separately. And then that's three people having some cool gear that maybe the other person two or three doesn't have so you share um, expenses right so it's always a good thing yeah, yeah. and then yeah. and then it's what we were talking about earlier it's all about numbers but cool uh staff are one two and three they each get 10 days yeah right okay well a lot a lot of cool sessions can happen in a 10 days in a month so um i i think there's just there's 
there's opportunities that um, are, are way outside of having to book a, re a recording studio. And, and you could try things. Um, who in here is a, is a user of like slate drum triggers? Everybody probably. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody uses slate here. <laughs> okay, cool. So every time, I mean, right, we're just, I, I, I'm, supposed, I'm, I'm supposed to be telling my life story. I'm so mm -hmm. bored with me. I, but I just want to talk about things that you would be thinking about that I know what those things are now, but I never thought about them and maybe at your age. So um, cool. When you're using slate drum triggers, I want to challenge all of you to realize you are now going into make-believe. You are not engineering any physical matter. You are not... You are not engineering air being pushed. Trust me, I think you're plenty cool. This is not like Uncle 90s judging you. But please, in your mind, understand that you are in make-believe land. And, and wear it. And meaning, <clears throat> those sounds have been recorded in a, an amazing studio, and they're mastered already. <laughs> And then you're going to add other players to those tracks with like these mastered drums. Wow, what a climb to get the other tracks to behave like those triggered um, bundles, those drum trigger bundles. So, but um, what, what, one of the things that I would, I would want all of you to do, and I'll tell you why, but if, you're, if there's a drum <clears throat> set or that, what, you know, there's your favorite triggers, maybe use them in, in parallel, or it's the sound you just use, period, because of where you're recording. But really, under, like, talk to your friends that are into the same stuff you're into. Like, it, it's way more awesome than talking about bad news on Instagram and, and Fox News. Like, ask, ask yourself and, and your buddies, like, why that bass drum sounds so good. And then maybe give yourself some, a personal rock challenge to try to figure out how to capture that type of sound yourself. And is it, is it, a, a, is it, is it futile? Is it, is it a, just a time consuming thing to, to impress me? No, it's, it's just training your ear to replicate something that you really love. And, um, and, and some years ago, to get those types of stable sounds and that bespoke of a sound, you'd have to know that drummer. So, you know, let's, let's say their name is um, Drummer A. To get Drummer A to come to your session would have been an airplane ticket, a hotel, a driver, um, maybe... A uh, deep preamp. What's that? Neve preamp. Oh, I'm just talking about getting that drummer to you. <laughs> right. You know, and then Ross, the drum doctor, would have to send a U-Haul truck of the drums. You know, so I mean, it's... So you have access to this really like, holy grail high, high level of thing. But what I'm getting at is <clears throat> we don't... We haven't figured out how to put a DI box on the singer's neck yet. So we still have to be... We have to be... We have to have a tremendous awareness of the manipulation and capture of, of um, propulsion and air and sound. And so, um, but really the, the, having those slate drum triggers and then just yourself trying different microphones and tuning the bass drum and moving a microphone and whack, whack and the snare and just, it will train your ears for things much greater than just drum stuff. Because maybe, maybe you've hit a, a, a peak and you actually never need to record a drummer. That's awesome. Um, maybe that's behind you and where you're going. You know, that's fine. Um, does anybody want to add to that? How about samples of the kit? Samples of the kit? Samples of the kit. That's kind of what I was meaning, I suppose, right? Uh, was, oh, sorry. Uh, that's, I guess that was what I was talking about, right? The, the, the Stephen Slate drum yeah. samples, well, yeah. Uh, Make your own samples? No, I mean your own samples of the recorded kit. The, you tune the kit to the particular song, and then you, 
you start taking samples of the individual's drum, so maybe you can control some of the hi hat lead on the snare. That mm -hmm. type of. I I think that's amazing too, and it's it's, I think that's a better place for me that's a better place to go is to look at the drummer that we have coming in and if we need that stability of a trigger yeah, at, is to make it, it mm -hmm, make it with them and it could be a really innocent capture it's not completely mastered yet right like but yeah you know be using it raw essentially you're just taking the drum raw as it is and, and getting the initial uh ranges capture mm -hmm. yes you know, store those, uh, and then Merrick maybe do some uh, uh, parallel processing, bring those up underneath sure. uh, the recorded tracks. Uh, I think you equate that with the slate trigger. I I think I think what you're talking about, Carlos, is is um, is is a is the next for me. That's a, a higher destination. Just for me personally, I'm not picking on anybody. Than just going. I've got this slate drum package and I'm going to trigger these in. I think making your own is way better because one of the things, as much as I, I really enjoy the Kemper um, virtual amps, I enjoy triggering. But anytime, you know, it's just, I want to engage everyone to embrace when you're in make believe and when you're, 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 you're rep helping replicate the noise that a gang is doing in your recording space. And uh, using those tools, it, uh, 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 an auto-tune or a Kemper amp, because you know maybe that's just what they're into, or you can't have a lot of loud guitar noises where you're at, or maybe you need to have drum pads and use the slate. It, that's, that's just surviving being able to record or not. And I understand how utilitarian that can be but um try to try to keep try to keep microphones on humans alive as many new tools we have that um help us one of the things that they're um, i'm my fear is that they're going to make us all sound a little same and um and it's something i picked up with melodyne um there was a um, there was a there was a uh, a hard rock group out of Florida. I wish I could uh, remember the name, but um, anyway, and in fact, I shouldn't even say it because I I enjoy them. But uh, I know the I know the guitar player, and they they put out some record, and it was produced by um, Howard Benson, who's a strong record producer. But let's say this band sounds like somewhere between a modern Leonard Skinner meets Black Sabbath. The Melodyne was so aggressive on the singer that somehow this male singer sounded, had a, a, a timbre um, and a sound that was so similar to Taylor Swift. And, and, I, and, 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 and if you go back historically and you look at old recording studios like Trident in London, um, You're So Vain by Carly Simon, which is a really killer track, was made at Trident and so was Hey Jude. That was made at Trident. Wow. They sound nothing alike. And um, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie was recorded at the same studio. They sound nothing alike. So somehow we fast forwarded and a band that's inspired, right there it is, David Bowie and Carly Simon, both same studio. They don't, they're not sharing. It's, it's probably the same channels and microphones. And they, they just sound like the individual versus they're being kind of um, homogenized into this one perfect being. Sure. Um, so, um, and, and I, and in full disclosure, I will use plugins when I need to, but I'm, I'm really trying to win a battle with microphones on sound, sounds and people. And, and, but, uh, I want to ask maybe more questions. Um, what are the key things, you know, what, that all of you are looking for when you're going to record a solo artist or a band? What are the things you're looking for before it starts? The session starts. I do have a question. Um, a lot of the people I work with live entirely in what you describe as 
a yeah. make believe universe. These are bed, <laughs> bedroom producers. These days, they have uh, you know like a blue snowball or a shore. They probably don't even have a MIDI controller. They're making music entirely in in their DAW, and they have zero you know zero recording experience, zero studio time. What what, what would you? I guess, what would you advise for producers like that who live in this make-believe sort of environment? Well, and, and so I, if you yeah. don't mind, I'm going to say it too, just so the people online can hear because there's not a mic on you. I'm just going to repeat the question a little bit if you can. Uh, and by the way, too, if, if we do have questions from people online, don't, don't hesitate to jump in too because we have a lot of people listening online. But he was asking, he's basically saying, uh, you know, I have, you know, most of the people I'm hanging out with are in the box, right? And are you know, kind virtual of instruments. virtual instruments, yeah. Yeah. you know, so what's your suggestion for those people? You know what I mean? Well, and <clears throat> like creation is creation, right? The, the sheer act of today, we, me, right? We're going to, I'm going to do something and I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to create the, the coolest thing I can either by myself or with others. To me, that's already righteous. You win. So, if it's in the box and it's a MIDI thing, or it's drawing the beats in because you have to wear headphones because the studio is the laptop, then I got it. I don't have an issue with that. It's just, rec number one is recognizing where those sounds came from. What am I drawing in? What inspired that? How did they record this, this item? What, um, when I'm when I'm, I, I have a MIDI melody that I've, I've drawn in. Okay, it's, it's drawn in with the mouse. Cool. Maybe have a, a little bit of chops to be able to go play it on a keyboard too. To, you know, just like a little $100 cheap Casio. Um, just, but one foot in the make-believe if necessity dictates that, but also one foot out where you could you could speak musically to yourself at minimum and hit something that makes a noise even if the computer is off or you recorded something that you really like and and maybe you want to come out of your converter and run it through like a tiny little lamp and put a, a microphone on it and one of my, everybody's favorite microphone the the sure sm57 put that on it and and then point it and make it do kind of typical things, speaker or this or point nowhere, have it on the ground. Just uh, it play with what the capturing of something pushing air, you know? So uh, maybe, but just always taking the time to l look at the process is that's a process that was enabled because someone else started you here. Yeah, and, and um, <clears throat> but um, if it's a good song and, and it's entertaining, um, a fan or anyone that loves a song is, 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 is not gonna give you a bad Yelp review that it was masterfully done and it's their favorite song they've ever heard and it made them it, like some maybe even save their lives and it was made on a laptop in a bedroom that that's not going to mean anything but us we're we're the ones like getting inside these recordings we we should fact check where these things came from and be curious about it and um because the time will come where the bedroom recording um producer may get invited to come to a to do a recording session at a at a studio and then and uh, and uh, they sh that that person should never feel that they're below anyone at the recording studio because they don't know how to get 10 microphones on a drum kit that if if they're brilliant that and have great chops well just you know, just recognize that you might be, you're, you're growing in this sector, but maybe you missed some of the, the how the sausage was made, so to speak. And, and so just don't let, don't get too far out of the origins of those sounds. Yeah, and I sense? think too, I mean, like getting organic sounds like that is always going to add to a recording, right? You've got to yeah. throw some mics on things, make some noise or, 
you know, just do that kind of stuff. Come on in, man. Come, come sit. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, cool, man. Well, so I wonder if we could open up some questions. Are the people online have any questions? So first one I got was uh, was somebody that asked, what are some of the negative parts about the music industry? <laughs> right, challenges. <clears throat> well, I'll, um, you know, earlier earlier I was talking about right my little story. I was in a band and then I became a band member and a producer, and now now I'm a record producer and studio owner. So I we're we're here for really the arts and sciences and the entrepreneurship of, of record production. So I'll stick with that. I think some of the negative sides of it for um, recording <clears throat> is to recognize conflict. And, 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 and um, I don't think I, I, I want to get too vast in, I, would, I just want to center in one lane. Um, if we are telling people that we're the recorder person, right? Like, all right, I love being creative with bands or solo artists. Um, I, have, I have my awesome studio in my bedroom or I have my studio in my house. I, you know, I have my brick and mortar, how, whatever it is. I have a room at space recording, whatever it is. Um, the, the hardest experiences I've had was the band, I, I, I needed it to be understood that I was going to do my best and they were going to do their best. And somehow, I was more into it than them. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's kind of a, that's, I think, as far as just the function of recording, um, those, are, those are kind of heartbreaking things. And it's, it's really hard to tell. What you do know, you do in that case? What's that? You know, when you show up with a band and you feel like you're literally more into it than they are. And, and, and it's, it's, um, there's a lack of balance. Uh, the amount of time it might require to inspire them. Um, you know, there, there's, it just may not ever line up with the financial metric that their session would, would accrue. Um, it's hard for them to get excited. You know, it, it's just... Um, but... but as a recordist, the, the, the negative thing I would say is, uh, first of all, bands not being rich, that's not a negative thing, that's whatever. Like I, I don't expect one band to uh, buy my gold teeth or something. But just my, my, my number one like, heartbreaker is when I'm in, more into it than them. Yeah. And then I'm just somehow the bully. Yeah. Come on, let's do it again. They're like, why, man? <laughs> it's just like yeah. it's just conflict. Oh man, that's so like, man, why are you not into your own music? I don't, I don't understand. Why am I pushing the artists to do more when they don't even want to do their own taste? Why? And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, I'm like, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm an epic, you know, pre pre setter upper, you know, and uh, I go to rehearsals and yeah. and uh, so I have the studio kind of waiting for the group and. You know, it's air fresheners, I've scrubbed everything. I'm really pumped, you know, like I'm gonna have a fresh shave. We can do anything. Like, you know, I'll still kind of get nervous, you know, like, yeah. well, what if, what, if, what if I don't do a good job, you know? I told them I was gonna be awesome, you know? So, um, but uh, yeah, when, but when the, when the band is not as, as uh, crazy about it as we are, it just has conflict. So that's, that's my answer. So what's another one? You know, what I, mean? uh, I got a question for you, just because I, just, you know, you were talking about doing, you know, trying to capture everything as you can live in your session. Now, when you say you sometimes use plugins, I mean, do you mix in the box of art? Do you try to do absolutely everything analog, even after the recording process? So, so, and I'll, let me just give a little context here too. The bubble's been like one of the. <laughs> biggest analog studio mainstays of all time. So just mm. whatever that's worth, it's why the question's pretty relevant. Well, in, in general, um, and, and um, I, I, I technically think that this can happen with, it will, it's, it's performance, right? And uh, arrangements, 
just everyone, all the players being aware of each other, you know. Um, but the whether you use like the unison preamp in uh, Universal Apollo, where it, it dictates that the uh, virtual sound effects that you're using, virtual compression, equalization, um, it burns it into the wave, right? That's called unison, is that right? Okay. Whether you, you're doing that or hardware, uh, but in general, for me, you know, um, if the Unity tracks, uh, you know, like the drums in particular, don't sound like a mixed record, then, then um, the drummer and myself still need to do some soul searching. We need to kind of figure, dig into it, figure out where something's getting overshot and talk about it, you know. But, um, but yes, uh, once, once the drums are recorded, um, they don't really change much for me. So, um, um, but it's, it, it's, it's basically just a series of turning tracks off or, or on. So, do you do you record in Pro Tools or do you? Um, I I w yes, but uh, but my favorite system is called uh, the Is Radar Studio, and so it has no plugins and it's just track one is a wave and it shows up on fader one. Yeah, and you're playing it through a board, right? Yeah, yeah. That, so, but that um, I I typically move faster with that, and um, um, even Ryan that. Uh, He's Henderson went somewhere. Um, I just produced a, a few songs with um, uh, a group, Katie Rain, that he's in, um, and uh, the it started off in Radar, and then yeah. and then was mixed in Pro Tools. But okay, those eventually it, mixed in Pro Tools. Yeah. But it it started off in um, <clears throat> Radar because um, I just I just didn't want the the band or Katie to. Um, I didn't want to give in to having all these you know, creature tools. comforts, you know, right. where I could I yeah. could doctor playback. I, I like there was something that that she was looking for, and I just it, I wanted it to go, if if it was going to sound good coming out of the speakers, it was because it went into the session that way. Yeah, and and the other thing was uh, instead of using the going into tempo or uh, tempo mapping and having to be that self aware. Um, um, I was just using my iPhone's uh, click track, and mm -hmm. then we were, uh, I was printing that as a live audio track. Yeah, yeah. And then moving the tempo up and down. Ryan and I were like, on this fill, we'll bring you up. And, cool. And oh, so, okay, cool. So, like manually, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ryan, so, you can play to a click track? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, there was some tempo movement in the songs, and you're like, yeah, that's cool. I'll, let's, just, let's just lay that down and. And just sitting there playing, and I'm just moving it up and down. You live now too. <laughs> nice. So the, the, to those quick tracks. Live to what we did, and not fuck up. Yeah, <laughs> but it's yeah, but right, you can. I but, like to breathe with it live. Like, mm -hmm. But if you if you want a chorus to pop, you know, if it goes up to BPMs, you know, that's that's an eye opener. You know, I guess Smashing Pumpkins at that moment, old school reference. They want the chorus to pop. That's when 80 guitars kick in. But you know, but the primal element of just tempo raising. Um, but if if for whatever reason, if I need to get into my own version of make believe, and that's and there's a very profound musical reason, when I need to start doing some sound replacements, or um, chances are, I will do that, or I will call the drummer up and go. Hey, you want to come over and replay the thing? But if I find if I find myself or uh, my assistant Brendan, and we're just about to get like a mouse injuries because we're having to rebuild a drum kit, <laughs> um, I, I I would uh, just much ra rather just uh, a admit with the drummer. I I think I really misread something. The the rest of the track's feeling really good. I I didn't capture what you're doing so great. What are you up to today? And and generally, if the drummer lives locally they're like, you mean I get to come back over and play stuff? Like, yeah. I, 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 I would rather do that than, yeah. I would also rather not get rid of a drum track, but, but um, I think that's, that's something. Uh, and, and then I have, I have, I have drums kind of set up that way where um, um, I don't think analog gear, um, having a, right, collecting analog gear and using that on sessions, I, I shouldn't, 
uh, be punished by that. I should have the same mobility as someone that's just going straight to converter. So, you know, just you write, write like these 20 preamps for drums, these four preamps for bass, these eight for guitars, another 20 for other stuff. But like just, it's like it's ready. So you have it all set up, kind of pre, pre sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And so you're not really breaking down the the kick drum right. assembly to get a good bass drum sound or sure. bass guitar sound, like yeah, yeah. just allocate it. And, but doing that straight to converter is also very optional. Um, and and um, to be totally fair, uh, the the Universal Audio 1073 go um, going into their LA2A and then. They're 1176. Those are the, that's the best 1073 and 1176 and LA2A I've, I've gotten to experience virtually. So, so it's pretty awesome to have that. I got those things. Yeah, uh, they're incredible. They come with the system. Yeah, yeah it's great. really amazing. Well, um, geez, I just feel like a librarian. Does anybody want to talk about drummers puking or anything? <laughs> like, Ryan did that one time. I, I, I figure there's, there's probably more. There's probably more stuff I, I, I didn't want to talk about, but um, I, it's, a, it's a bit of a projection of, of, of sorts. But, um, and this is, this is something maybe one of you can text me or call me one day if you figure out how to break through to this. But um, I think one of my goals is, is I'm trying to, if I'm, if I'm producing a group, and I'm, is, as fast as I can, I'm trying to figure out what songs and bands, maybe independent of the ones we're going to be working on, that they just like. I'm just trying to understand stuff they like. Where, Reference tracks. what's that? Reference tracks. Yeah, and just and for and for no particular reason, you know, it's just like um, if it was a restaurant, they they hate eating there, but they like how it smells. They like the lighting. It 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 can be. All, but it makes them happy for some reason, and they identify with it. It's kind of, if it if they were a, if they were if they had a bedroom full of rock and roll posters, it'd be those bands on the wall. Uh, Van Halen for me, um, but um, and 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 uh, l learning more about what they're into um, as a whole and and individually, and um, and then as. I'm, I'm hearing their demos of what, what we're going to record or what they're pitching that we record. You know, I, it's, 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 it's so freeing to be able to go back to their vibe tracks that they listen to when they, they're on their commute to work, you know, they, or when they go jogging or something. Like, it's like, cool, well, your song sounds like this, but this song that you love or these, these bands that are like your inspiration, they, they never do that. They're doing a whole lot less, you know, like the composition of it and the, um, and, and, um, and they're not in trouble and I'm not in trouble. I'm just more forensically kind of bringing up some, uh, I'm, I'm able to analyze what, what is happening in, in reference tracks or just bands that they idolize, like, and, 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 and ask more questions versus telling them they do anything wrong, right? Because a good producer is not a, uh, buzzkill, you know, you're you're not there to squash people, but you know, but but ask questions like, you know, if Queen was to do this track or the Cars or whatever whatever band, Foo Fighters, whatever reference you get, uh, um, they wouldn't be approaching the song that you sent this demo to me the same way. There would be these types of arrangement tweaks in it. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, put myself into my favorite records, and uh, I'm trying to help bands kind of jump into their own favorite records. And like, it's not, it's not, it's not that mysterious, you know. There's 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 an arrangement that affected how good the song feels. So uh, does that make sense? You know. Yeah. But asking asking bands, you know, for that reference track, and and if you hear what they're playing. And it has nothing to do with their reference tracks. You know, like, my references are so old school. It's like, well, you love Weezer, but the way you're playing sounds like fish on a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> That's a hell of a thing to 
get out in the Rectify. open and yeah. in private, right? You know, I'm not going to say that about anybody online, right? I wouldn't, but um, that's a great private share. And it's like, and then they realize, well, we're actually into fish. Great. And, <laughs> and then what do we lose? Conflict. And they're into it. <laughs> that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, are there more yeah, let's, cyber let's stalkers do, wanting yeah, to Yeah, let's do a couple more here? questions. You mentioned that they were asking, you know, what were some of your, you know, favorite albums or artists that, you know, for you personally that you just like that, you know, the way they produced it or the way that it's recorded or just sound audio-wise on either albums or uh, artists? <clears throat> Um, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of relevant to uh, to my age, but uh, definitely, um, uh, I I remember hearing um, um, "I'm Not in Love" by 10 CC as a young kid, and just like wow, that song. If you want to talk about imagination, that's imagination. Um, that is make believe. Voices don't do that. Um, uh, um, I love that as a kid. I, I, I think we're similar age, but um, I feel like you know the years, I, <clears throat> the year I was born, and just like getting to discover Kiss and Star Wars and uh, disco and the Bee Gees, and then boom, MTV comes out. Like it, it was, it was like just a golden era, and 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 inside of my younger childlike excitement for music that I still have. It's kind of what I do. Um, it didn't really matter what the genre was. All the recordings just were pushing the boundaries of, of a golden era of, of like pro audio. You know, there was like an, there was endless research and development for all these audio makers, you know, and so, um, um, and, and there was something really cool with the electric guitar that um, there was, all, you know, new bands would come out and they would do something new with drums, new with um, electric guitar. Um, and just, just hearing a track like Highway to Hell by ACDC and um, you're like, is that a human or, or witchy woman by the Eagles? And hear, hearing the reverb as a kid, like, you know, I'm kind of scared, but it's cool, you know. Just the, always, I always love the sound of it. Um, uh, but he hearing, I think hearing Thriller, you know, was was um, uh, Back in Black, you know, and Little League Football. They just wanted me to go. I wanted to go hit, hit my opponents. I got real pumped up. Um, uh, but uh, hearing hearing uh, like Van Halen and uh, that those types of guitar sounds were really just exhilarating. It, it just made me absolutely have zero interest in school. Uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> this is... Um, um, and then, uh, um, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm just a sucker for, for all that type of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, early 80s, late 70s, and then, uh, and then from early 90s, um, like kind of hearing, you know, Understanding as a player that I would never really be in a band like Van Halen, like that's a really gifted freak guitar player thing. But hearing a lot of British bands that were on Creation Records, um, they were kind of underground, but there was a handful of us that knew about these albums where uh, one person would maybe in that same mindset where I was talking about the three people having a studio, bring your compressors, we'll use your speakers, we'll ruin his mom's house, you know, but um, we were all buying records and making cassettes of them. So we got to hear, so I got to hear My Bloody Valentine, um, their Swerve Driver, and then um, uh, these were all like early 90s. And then um, um, I, I love that it, it was, it was high fidelity and they were just breaking tons of rules. And then uh, the records that the Flaming Lips were making in that era, and they're quite, they're, they're quite, um, Almost like circus music now, or something. That's not right, but um, I know what you mean. well, yeah. There's something. There's something kind of. They they have their own demented Disney kind of effect now. But like early '90s, they were just like this brutal, melodic, bizarre rock band, and so they were. Um, 
going into nice recording studios and kind of breaking them. And uh, so all of that stuff really affected me. And, and, um, um, and, I, and I, I kind of revisit all the time uh, any, any track historically that I remember having some type of love for. I'm always listening to it through studio speakers. Um, and especially like Rolling Stones, like, um, like something that's just so masterful, like give me shelter. The drums don't sound very good. They, they, they're, they're just, it's like, it, it, they're dumpy. Um, when the levee breaks drum sounds, those sound really bad on studio monitors. So, but when you hear them at a event or at a party or in your car, like it just works. Um, Boston, uh, more than a feeling, is really painful on studio speakers. It's really bright. Or Nirvana, never mind. I have one, I have three sets of monitors, and it sounds, it's the most drastic sounding different record I, I, I have on those three sets of monitors. Mm -hmm. And the guitars sound puny on my monitors. Mm -hmm. And the drums are abusively loud. And Yeah, they're really loud. And, uh, but it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so any w w brand new artists, do you have some people that you, you dig these days that, that are new people? I mean, um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's always, there, there's always may, uh, some groups I'll be working with that people would, would maybe have had a chance to see and then there's, or, or maybe they, they enjoy them. And then there's just brand new people that they're really kind of betting on themselves and me that we're going to build something, you know. And so, um, um, but uh, I did mention earlier that I've been been fortunate to get to work with Katie Rain, and um, um, that that was a really prideful recording <clears throat> because lyrically, Katie was talking about kind of self-empowerment in it, in, in her songs, and uh, standing up for, for, for um, a better life, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then having some sneer in it, too. And I was really glad that the <laughs> songs weren't written about me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, you know what I mean? They were, like, they were intense lyrics. And, and uh, that, the only way to really sell that emotion and that kind of um, emancipation of old self, I think, it... Um, was for her to do it with a live band, you know? And so uh, yeah. she was more known for, you know, everything was kind of programmed and uh, she really kind of gave me a chance and, and she was a little nervous. Can I be this exposed? I'm like, hey, we're both exposed. It's cool. And uh, um, there's a, another fella named uh, Rule Thomas that I'm, I'm working with and um, I, I helped him do a, a record deal with, um, uh, a punk label of all things called Descent Records, and um, it, it's, he's, maybe if you wanted to say he sounded like something, I, I, he's definitely inspired by the band Neil Young and John Mayer, but, all, but, but he also, you know, uh, loves Paul Simon, Graceland, and so we were just, it was really just the two of us playing on everything, and and then um, we um, had started, started having, um, we had Anor Peterson come in and play bass on a song. And then uh, Lee Wall, who's a drummer in one of my favorite bands, um, Luna from New York City, he, he, he played drums on one. And so he's just this industrious kind of go-getter and I uh, adore him. And um, long-term relationship, demented partnership with um, Jackie Vinson, we're, mm -hmm. yeah. we're continuously making albums. Oh, that's great. We have two albums that, we have one album that's done, and uh, I think it's her best record yet, And uh, but almost like in uh, how the Beatles put um, Let It Be out after Abbey Road was recorded. Like we might put out other records before we release the one that's done. Um, but um, yeah, there's, there's, um, and then I just, I just finished up a, a compilation album with um, 
Austin Music Foundation that actually kind of stuck me in, in the studio with a lot of people that yeah. I, I hadn't met. And so I had not met Anastasia Hurrah, I had not met Nimigata, uh, um, Pleasure Venom, that's a, that's a name, um, uh, Natalie Price, uh, uh, Quentin Arispe, or um, um, TV Temple, right? Uh, so anyway, that was a lot of bands, and uh, um, geez, uh, all, all of them really kind of floored me. Uh, one in particular, you know, I'll admit, uh, I'm, I'm doing more rock and roll and indie and that type of stuff. That's just, that's just what happened, you know? Um, um, I mean, I produce the front bottom, so people don't call me up for R&B. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, uh, uh, but Anastasia, hurrah, having, she, she just came in and uh, had, has this R&B killer band and they do all of this prep work together and Chip, their bass player, is a masterful um, um, home producer. And so just programmed a lot of stuff. The band learns it. I don't even know if they rehearse. They just, they just knew the tracks. Yeah, man. So um, that, that, those drums and that bass went down together live. Nice. And they encouraged me to, to make the bass drum and the bass guitar quite large. And because I could actually hear it at the same time, I was literally going to the, the knobs that make stuff get bigger in the low end. <laughs> the big knobs. It all it could take, and <laughs> they could hear it. And if they touched it too much, you know, they could hear like the preamp collapse, and they just like tuned their attack to it. Uh, I actually, I've never been that exposed with bad engineering. Um, but I'm. I'm more used to drummers that need to warm into the performance after the fill. You know, there's the bass drum on the one recovery smack. You know, it just no longer sounds like the, the bass drum. Um, but uh, that, was, that was really exciting. And, and just hearing that kind of singer that's just so fluid between rapping and singing and mixing, mixing her voice. There it is, it's pretty loud. It's even louder. It's even louder and then like weird stuff okay there's a lot of keyboards in this track and it's a part of the soup of it all right let's go into make-believe so every time the keyboards you know are existing with the vocal just ducking those down 4 db and then turning the voice up more and more and more and more and it just wasn't broken it's just like oh yeah that's talent <laughs> <laughs> but um listening nice. I guess listening back to those types of players and just being that exposed in, in a genre that I haven't spent a lot of time with, I didn't even recognize myself in it. Um, it was um, nice. just neat, just like, oh, cool. Maybe every day, every day should, I should feel this way. Yeah, you know, man. So. Oh, that's great, man. Cool for you. That's, that's awesome. So uh, let's, uh, let's, should we, should we, let's do one more question, then I have a final question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and chill out. So do we have one online or do you guys have one in here? Is there, Cause I can, I can ask the final one too, if you want. One was asking about if you had any thoughts on spatial audio and if you thought that that would replace traditional or stereo recordings in the future. No, no I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for my personal needs, I, I, um, I feel the, the stereo field is, is a, is a is a is a is a limitless frontier. So as a consumer, I'm good with uh, that. But um, you know, if um, I can't even comment on that, that that feels like the uh, the 16-bit um, 441 MP3s versus 96K. Um, it's like if the government wants to buy us new sound systems, then we will do it. And I'll probably enjoy it. But if this little phone's got two speakers, or mine has two and one of them's broken, and I can kind of hear, although that's how a lot of us hear a song for the first time. Um, we'd have to figure out who, um, who's going to get behind that because um, yeah. unless Spotify funds it, because that's who's getting the money now. So um, we'll see. 
Uh, but I, I, uh, I, I, I don't need much more than the stereo field. It's, it's something that um, I discover the, the bottom of it, the top of it, the left and right, the, the depth of it. Um, it is a mysterious world, just wonderland. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm perfectly pleased in that. And frankly, I, I, I got a lot to catch up with just figuring that out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, being able to, you know, make things happen in the stereo field is is a chef. If you don't know how to do that really well, you're not going to do great with spatial audio. <laughs> right. that, say you, you use the, the frequency to place it in the stereo field. Is, certain, is that mm -hmm. where you begin? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will, um, I will, duplicate. Um, uh, parts of a of a right musical composition i'll i'll have different buses that i'm mixing from and uh, i'll do uh parallel buses of uh of a uh, uh, out of phase uh, wide left and right and collapsed um uh, kind of uh, mono signals that just live right here and like just uh Kind of, kind of a bargain basement frequencies. I can only afford two thousand of them right there, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I love. Right, the mix is already done, and then you kind of go in and try to bulk out versus EQing the whole mix. It's like, well, wh why, why do I want more low end? Is it on everything, or is it, is it just in the center? Is it on everything that generates low end? Um, but I, I'm, I'm whether I can explain it to myself or not, I'm looking for more crossover points than sound systems can ever invent. I'm, I'm, look, I'm desperate to find them. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, I think the spatial audio thing is, if it's, um, you know, the, it, it's, it's the consumer end of it that has to be there for it to be viable. I mean, you know, the CD player was there, so we had it, and man, they, it, became the thing to buy, but we've got to have something to consume it on, right? And that's going to be the biggest deal. It's kind of like this Dolby Atmos thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And, that, and that type of thing, right, that, that, that type of thing, you know, is if, if as consumers, you know, like, if we're enjoying the music of the world so much, right, um, that we're going to, what, it, let's just imagine this large number it would cost for every household to update to that kind of sound system. Well, the, your love of music is what inspired that, right? And so, or their love of music is what inspired this investment into our music consumption. Um, I, I would just hope before we make that jump that we can um, recognize uh, how to, how to, that there's a farm to table element from band even even if it's a major label band, but, but try to do more purchasing from the band. If you love that band, try to consume from them directly as much as you can before you go give, uh, you know, some stereo maker or audio maker <laughs> thousands of dollars. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. they're they're just spinning the song. There's, but um, Spotify's, um, you know, they're they're allowed to. Um, pay as poorly, but uh, the reality is uh, we're just in this pickle. And, and, and if you pay X amount a month and you can listen to the, the world of recorded music, well, there's something really cool about that. But I don't know, just when you keep going back to those 10 bands, try to, try to maybe figure out how to buy that record or download it legitimately where you can have it with you, whether if you lost Wi-Fi, you could still play your key songs. Somehow. Or put it on loop and have it play over and over and over and over yeah. and over and over and over and over, and over again. And then at least they're getting a little bit of money. But I want, I want to see the bands um, get... Uh, I, I want to see them more recognized in, uh, in keeping new musical memories alive, creating new history. Yeah. Financially, that is. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm way below that. I mean, I'm way below that. I want to see them do better. And if they're doing better, then by default, I kind of drag up with them. So.
Well, cool. So I'll ask one last question, and uh, you know, and then we'll we'll chill out and hang out. And of course, it's almost kind of a key question for me. Um, is just uh, you know looking at it from the standpoint of you know Alec and you know Andrea and these guys, you know Caleb, and just any of the other you know guys out are getting into it, right? I mean, if uh, if you were 20 right now, and I know it's a little different time than it was in, you know, the 80s, 90s, but, uh, but if you were getting into it right now, what would be your best advice? I, I, <clears throat> I think I hinted on it earlier, and um, um, I think um, outside of musical dreams, I think some of the worst the hardest times I maybe have had in my life is when I allowed myself to be isolated. So having a gang is, um, is cool. Um, so if you, have, uh, if you have a few buddies that you trust, you know, like you could trust with your car keys and you know, just like a, a good trust and you could figure out some common recording space, I think Someone in their 20s having a studio co-op where, where they can make the big noise. And then if it needs to go to more separate, where I'm just laptoping, that's a part of it too. But just having a bit of a headquarters where each person, by default, bought different tools than the other person had. And then you put them all together, you're like, wow, we kind of have a, we have a recording system. Um, and then, and it, and it keeps one individual from having to go spend. And you know, you could you could invent the number, but there's sure. a there's a budget that just more than is, they should in, is is limitless, <laughs> you know. But yeah, but uh, but even spending ten thousand dollars is that's that's a lot. But if that was spread out by three people, but you could also spend three hundred thousand dollars, and you, you know, that's but but just. Keeping it fun and, and having a kind of a gang and a and um, and uh, there's a sense of morale. One person learns something like, I found a thing, you know. Like, um, it looks different, but it kind of mirrors the past of where great record producers came from. Is they they worked in these multi complexes. There wasn't just Roy Thomas Baker didn't just fall the Queen producer of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. He didn't just fall out of the sky. He was working at DECA and just like operating the tape machine and speaking when spoken to. <laughs> Moved on from that, went to Trident. So, um, but there was a but constant sharing of, of ideas just, just because you're in proximity of each other. But there's some things about isolation that are good for the recording process. And there's some of it that just makes us weird and not know how to talk to people. And I, w I would avoid that, because you know? <laughs> we're already going to have the weird thing down. Like we're into sound, yeah. <laughs> but um, but it it also informs time management. If if there's a band or producer co-op, if Alec needs to use the studio tomorrow, and Indri's still in there, and Indri's been in there, can't figure out what's going on. Alec texts texts at 10, 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Hey, I'm coming in tomorrow at noon. Please not have the place trashed. Whoops, reality. Cool, get it done. <laughs> Those are great influences, like time management, and that that and your time is worth something. And right, and you know, what what are you going to accomplish for yourself selfishly? What what does your day mean to you? So that it kind of it polices us having to look at the clock a bit more when it's not just our sole recording space. But um, yeah, I, I like a, I like a gang, I suppose. So cool. uh, I would I would look for those commonalities, and they're maybe a lot closer to you than you realize. Yeah, man. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. So. Yeah. So cool. We're gonna hang out a little more. We'll if you guys uh, want to eat some more food and just jibber jabber some more. And guys online, thanks for coming, and we'll see you guys, you know, on the flip side.